Thank you, Tracy. I'm using this microphone, but it doesn't make any difference to you. It just goes to the camera. So don't be thinking you're going to get great stuff out of this. You have to hear me. And I'm going to stand here because most of this presentation has to do with what's on the screen, not so much with me. And we're going to kind of tag team our way through this. Uh, this is the first time we've tried putting this all together at once, so you're all the guinea pigs. <laughs> My name is Mark Ilton. Uh, I've been a member at Camp Cleghorn since 1992, and I'm probably one of the younger uh, participants in camp. Uh, I'm from Stevens Point. Uh, we found the camp to be a wonderful place to come with our kids, and, and we just got excited about that uh, and, and ended up there. We were fortunate enough to have that happen. So let's go to the first slide, if you would, Tom. This is an overview of the camp. Um, this was a quadcopter that did this, and Tom Charlesworth and one of his friends put it together. But I thought we would start off with this, since it gives you a, a feel for what the camp really looks like once we get up in the air here a little bit. Uh, you see our swimming area right there. Uh, that's the only uh, permitted swimming area uh, on the chain of lakes, uh, uh, with the exception of one in the small chain. And then as we get a little bit higher, you can see our point. That point has no, no piers, no docks. Uh, it's just been kept in its uh, natural state. Now we'll disorient you a little bit and swing all the way around. So those are Camp Cleghorn Piers. We, we share our piers uh, and assign them to the residents. Uh, we have a limited number that we are able to put up based upon uh, discussions with the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, they occasionally check us. We police that to make sure that there aren't too many craft in the water uh, at any particular time. So here you have another good look at the point, and right in the center at the top, you can see the roof of the chapel. Uh, the camp extends uh, to the left into the bay. Uh, for those of you that know, that's the channel into Dake Lake. Uh, that's the end of Camp Cleghorn. So it runs from the channel at Dake Lake all the way up to the right uh, to the end of those piers, uh, not, not quite to uh, the channel to, to Lawn Lake. You've got some views here of the, the cottages. Uh, and if we get back on land, and I don't know if we will, uh, <laughs> but I think we will. You can see in the upper left, that's, uh, that's not a good picture of it unless we kind of turn a little bit, but that's our ball diamond. Um, that open area right in the center screen above a little bit of the piers, that was where the old boat livery was. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, there's, that's Dake Lake in the background. Uh, I don't know if we're going to see uh, Lost Lake or not. We might. Uh, our Fellowship Hall, this is the swimming pier. If you went straight up uh, from the pier, you'd be at the Fellowship Hall. And then across the road uh, would be the chapel. So that's the orientation there. This, this swimming hole is kind of iconic. It's been there for a long, long time. And there are pictures of this place, and lots of things change, but the swimming pier never seems to change. Uh, so it's, it's been the focal point. So in a little bit, they're going to land this thing, because they probably got seasick looking up at that thing flying around. But it is amazing uh, what you actually can do with this. Here you'll see the guilty parties. Okay. <laughs> there they are. And this is a nice swimming pier uh, because it drops off quickly after the pier. It's down to about 13 feet deep. There's a dry diving raft out there. Uh, and so that that is available for the residents and uh, guests of the residents. Here it comes, and they, they managed to retrieve it and not <laughs> plop it in the water. So that's an overview of the camp. And we'll 
we'll go on to the next slide, and this is a still shot. Now, um, and Tom can point some of these things out with a little arrow, but Lost Lake is right smack in the middle there. Now, I'd venture to say that at least uh, half, if not more than half of the people in Camp Cleghorn have never seen Lost Lake. I have never seen Lost Lake. Really? Uh, shocking, I know. <laughs> but I haven't seen Lost Lake. And, and the reason is in the summer, you got to have a death wish to go down there and fight the mosquitoes. And in the wintertime, well, you sometimes you're here and sometimes you're not, and then you need to have time to do that. And, and I've just never done that. We'll see a picture of it later on. But it's a fascinating thing, and it's, it's all part of a wetland system that Camp Cleghorn is responsible for protecting. Uh, so uh, it's not just what camp has on the shoreline uh, that's important. It's the whole 29 acres is the size of, of the camp with everything included. So you can also see the chapel uh, with the nice shiny uh, steel roof there. And the fellowship hall is just below that. And then if you look further over to the right, way to the center right, you'll see the ball diamond that area right in there. And there's also a tennis court. We'll see another still of that later on. So let's go to the next slide. Camp Cleghorn is open to the public for worship uh, from the Sunday after uh, Memorial Day until the Sunday of Labor Day weekend. And assuming that it's not really rainy, uh, we will get attendance in the neighborhood of 100 uh, to 130 people uh, each Sunday. And uh, it, it's been a steadily growing uh, thing. Uh, Camp Cleghorn uh, is, is not our legal name. Our legal name is the Good Templars Training School Incorporated. And Camp Cleghorn was an offshoot of that training school, and the, the idea of that training school was to promote temperance. Camp Cleghorn was founded, founded in 1897. And uh, <clears throat> over the years, uh, the temperance movement has come and gone, uh, and ultimately Camp Cleghorn kind of just had a life of its own that continued because of the way um, people had moved into camp for summer times, uh, things of that nature. But our whole goal as far as summer uh, time is to provide uh, worship services that, that they don't emphasize temperance like they used to. Uh, we do have a temperance uh, sermon and Sue Hackbarth will talk about that. But uh, but typically, the services are just non-denominational, and so we welcome anyone that wants to come. You can see, and you'll see another slide later on, uh, where this is our sign now. And uh, for those of you with sharp eyes, you can see where something has been ghosted out. And, 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 yeah, it's no longer private, and so you'll see the, the, when the transition was made. So let's go to the next slide. Now, this is not as clear as I'd like it to be, but I'm going to start you at the corner of Cleghorn and Camp Road. <coughs> this is where they just hit a gas line. <laughs> so you can't get through there right now. Right. Um, and if you were at the wheelhouse or the Indian Casino and came down Cleghorn Road, you would get to this intersection just after you crossed the, the Bay Lake Channel. And if you proceeded on Camp road, you would go past the cottages. There's 41 cottages and room for one more. Uh, that it's not that it's for sale, it's, the lot is owned, but it hasn't been built. And these lots were developed over the years because when the camp first got started, people tented. And then tents were assigned and tents were rented. And ultimately, there were two lots front to back on both sides uh, so that all the tents had room to, to be there. There were tents out on the ball diamonds too, I'm sure. Um, and over the years, the, the lots were condensed uh, such that there, there's kind of a double lot for most cottages. 
uh, and that's how we ended up with this 41. So if you proceed down uh, Camp Road, you'll eventually get up to uh, that little intersection at the very top, uh, and then where the pointer is right now, it's sitting right on top of the chapel. That's where that is. Uh, the Fellowship Hall is just across the road uh, from the chapel, which is right there. Okay, And then if you kept going down Camp Road, until you get to the bunch of intersections there, um, the, the top one is just a little road that services some of the cottages. But if you head toward the bottom of the slide, uh, you've got Camp Road is the middle one, and Court Road is the road that's further to the right, which takes us down into our trailer court. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And then you can see Lost Lake on here, and you can see the, the wetlands that are associated with Lost Lake, uh, and all of this by deed rep rep uh, reservation is preserved uh, in posterity. So that's, that's the lay of, of Camp Cleghorn. So let's go to the next slide. All right, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Sue to, to talk a little bit about the chapel and maybe a few historical things if she wants to, or you can give it back to me, whatever you prefer. But uh, you see how it works. You can't you can't say anything wrong. <laughs> okay, my name is Sue Hackberg. They needed a tabernacle, and in their definition, a tabernacle was a church slash auditorium. So they were using it for meetings. Most of them were for the cause of temperance. But they were also holding big assemblies that would, people would come for like a week, two weeks, sometimes even longer. Hard to believe you could come to a temperance uh, service kind of thing that would last for two weeks, but okay. Um, anyway, they would come and so they decided we're gonna build the uh, chapel. And the chapel is the original building, nothing is different except that we've shored it up a couple of times because it was leaning. Um, it was originally built on a slant, so inside there was a sandy floor, and uh, they eventually built a stage, which we have now replaced after, well, what did we do that, two years ago? A new stage, and um, so that's lasted pretty good. Uh, the new stage was built with all volunteer help in camp. We had 20-some people that came and went and built that stage. Um, all, a lot of volunteer things. Um, we've used um, <clears throat> some memorial money to put a carol on, on top of the chapel. And many of you here, our bells go off at 9, 12, and 6, and they play inspirational music. Sometimes Christmas music at Christmas time. Sometimes we forget to change it and it's February and it's still <laughs> playing. But um, when your windows are closed, you don't notice those things. Uh, uh, so we have this, the beautiful Carolina. We're very uh, proud of that. Um, oh, aren't those cute? That's you, isn't it? That's my father. That's your father. 1928. I wasn't quite born. You weren't quite born. That's your father. And then that would be your. That's Betty. That's Betty. Okay. And Betty, if some of you know the, the boat livery, she ran the boat livery, Betty Prell. And she and Norm ran the boat livery. So that's Betty. And oh, cute. Okay. Okay. You just let me do that. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, <laughs> this is the shoreline way back when, and we had a boathouse down there, and later the boathouse disappeared and it was still called the Old People's Dock. Yeah, I don't know why, <laughs> except that a lot of old people like to sit down there. Uh, but you can see the old canoes along the shore. Uh, you don't see too many motor boats, just um, probably some very old, what were the motors then? Johnson's, probably, yeah. Um, oh, here we go. The, the people who came to Camp Cleghorn had to come by train or car. Now, somebody's gotta help me. Where did they stop? Streetcar? And they got on, a, into Wapaka, but then they had to take 
the, the street cop to King, and then I think from King, then they got on Captain Cleghorn's boat <coughs> and came to camp, excuse me, <coughs> came to camp on those. Don't you just love to see their long dresses and their white shirts and ties? Um, and they're going camping. <laughs> And here we have people enjoying the swimming dock. Okay, Tom, who's, who's in the canoes? That, again, is my father, and that's Betty Prell. Okay, that's Betty, too. Okay. This is my mother, Doris Charlesworth. This is Oral Mae Thompson. Okay. And this is Betty Prell. Okay. This is Carol Degott. <laughs> oh, my. Is, okay. Which is uh, <coughs> Betty's daughter. And this is Trudy Panko. <coughs> and Trudy's still in camp. So yeah, lots, <coughs> lots and lots of family history. Um, third, fourth generations, cottages passed down through generations. Okay, what do we have here? What do we have, Mark? You better do that. Yeah, this is uh, looking a lot like the map that you saw earlier, except it's really old. This map, uh, if you, you can't read it, but it was from 1922. So this is even before the, the chapel auditorium was built. If you can't, again, you can't really read it, but right up here, it says amphitheater is what it says on the, on the map. And you can see that, that uh, Lost Lake was still lost even back in 1922. <laughs> but the road layout was uh, the same, pretty much. Uh, and I don't know that we ever had boats like this soon <laughs> <laughs> showed up. But it gives you a, <laughs> an idea of all those lots being laid out for campers, really, at that time. Uh, it, it didn't morph into cottages until considerably later. So. Oh, here's our, um, one of the dorms that were built on the property to house uh, church groups that came in or meeting groups that came in for the cause of temperance. We had a boys dorm. Wait a minute. Yeah, that was the boys dorm or was that the girls dorm? That's the girls. Tom, that's the girls. girls. See, they know more than I do. Okay, that was the girls dorm and then down near the baseball field was the boys dorm. Inside the girls dorm we had a dining hall and we even have a uh, sign that's still up in the dining hall and it says uh, meals for uh, 25 cents. So yeah, good luck with that. And then off to the side is a little um, store and where you could get ice cream and that stayed for a long time. I remember going to the store for ice cream after skiing time, uh, but that is no longer there either. In place of this dorm, we built our fellowship hall. That's another picture of the dorm. And that's inside, that's the dining hall. And if you come to our fellowship hall today, you will see those exact same tables and those chairs. It's just in a different facility. Again, the boathouse on the shore that is no longer there. This was the first Prell's boat livery. Um, very crude at that time. Tom, do you know what, when that was? I, it's on that cheap. 1912. 1912, okay. And Norm bought it in, I think, 49? 49. Yes. So Norm and Betty Prell bought it in 1949 and ran it until Bruce Becker bought it. And then later he moved it over to where he is presently. Tom, is that Norm on the end of the pier? Might be you, Tom. No. <laughs> Two, I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't I don't know. I can't tell. It looks like it could be. Okay. Skeeter in there? <laughs> who, who knows? Okay, these are some of the cottages. Um, we can point out that Mark lives in the white one with the brown trim. <laughs> and there's our chapel. Uh, even in the winter, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful building. Uh, and you see the carillon on top um, that plays the, the beautiful music that, you know, treats you all, we hope. This is one of the assembly 
uh, newspapers. And if you have time afterwards, there's a book in the back, a loose leaf, that has a lot of these assembly newsletters that they put out. And I think they go back to the 1920s, right? Um, so there's some interesting information in there, but you'd probably have to stay about a week to read them all. <laughs> Oh, I can tell you. Yes, some of the famous speakers were William Jennings Bryan, Bob La Follette, and Dr. C. M. B. Mason, who was a great temperance leader. And then Senator Norris, George Norris, who had property over um, just off of, oh, would, would be kind of kitty corner from um, Bruce's area, uh, was also a speaker at the time. This is one of our services. Um, you'll probably notice a few uh, people from town. The second gentleman, well, the first lady is, is Lois Stangy, who has just passed away a couple years ago. Then you see John Hammond. And if you go all the way down to the end, that's Steve Scheller from King Barry. Um, and they were singing uh, for one of our services. That's uh, one view of it, and we keep uh, a posting outside, if so if you're driving through and you want to know who's preaching the next Sunday, just have a look and the information is up there for you. And after our, well you can see the doors that are open, that's our open air uh, church. On the other side, it's open also, so sometimes if you need to daydream, you have some beautiful things to look at. <laughs> I'm not sure the early temperance people were allowed to do that, but uh, uh, then in the back, uh, after church, we always have a little social with coffee and cookies like you have here, and everybody hangs around in the back and chit-chats for a while. It's very nice. And these are the two entrances. Mark talked about the first one, and the other entrance is on the other end of camp, and I believe pri privates removed it's from that. Right. It's from that one also. The they were, yeah, both the same. Okay, this is just an inside view of um, just actually very recently because you can see in the foreground our new stage and its nice shiny floor. Um, also off to the right, we have all new pews that were purchased from a church in Stevens Point. So uh, we've gotten rid of a lot of the old creaky ones. And, and the dirt floor has been gone for a long time. Yeah, the dirt floor is now uh, covered with blacktop, and of course the gas lights are no longer there. We have these less charming electric lights, but um, much safer, yes. <laughs> okay, um, just another view of our service. This is our fellowship hall across the street from the chapel. Uh, it was built in, I think, 1987. Uh, to replace the dorm, and we we do lots of fun things in there. Have potlucks and, um, of course, business meetings, and families can rent it to have family reunions and activities. Well, um, Eric will tell you about some of the things that we do in in that. Would you like him to do that now? Yeah, you want to check your notes to see if there's anything else. Okay, I'm I'm done with the chapel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, our chapel, I think uh, Mark said, is, is come as you are. This is one of our activities, a uh, potluck that we had. But come as you are, so if you're ever in the area, please join us for our services. They run from 9.15 until 10, and um, then coffee fellowship afterwards. And again, from June, the first weekend in June till, or through Labor Day. Um, we have retired ministers. Uh, actually, Jeff Fletcher, our local jeweler and pastor, is um, our coordinator, and he gets all the ministers for us, lines them up, and um, a different one every Sunday, and it's really quite pleasant. Um, nice variety. Very uh, numerous denominations our, our pastors come from. There's more activities. Why don't we give this to Eric? Yeah. Rumor has it that uh, if the pastor runs past 10 o'clock, he's not invited back. <laughs> this is Eric Lichtenwald. He's also uh, a member of a family that's got long time roots uh, in their cottage as well. And, and he's going to talk to you about some other things. 
hello everybody. <laughs> um, what, I, what I'm going to just kind of highlight is some of the more current day activities. I mean, the history is really important to us, but one of the things we really strive to as we're growing, and I'm part of the younger generation, and I'll be 65 <laughs> in a week or so, <laughs> is to really have a strong sense of community in our, in our camp and everything that we do. So I just jotted down a few of the things that might, you might find interesting that actually occur today in, in our Camp Claiborne. So in our community center, as uh, Sue briefly mentioned, there's a number of activities that happen that are regularly scheduled and some that are just spur of the moment. For instance, the potluck dinners that Sue mentioned where everybody in the community is encouraged to come and uh, they coordinate bringing in items. There's a soup supper that occurs where uh, members of the community or friends outside the community come. Um, community service meetings and crafts. I know that the community of Wapaka utilizes our community center for a number of very, very important things that are done for the benefit of, of all of Wapaka and that facility is used for those and I'm sure Sue could even mention more because I, I know that she's in charge of a number of those. Membership gatherings are held in the community center. We have several meetings throughout the year. Mark is going to talk a little bit about our organization and how we actually operate the community. Family and friends reunions is something that's becoming more and more popular um, with the membership in our community. In fact, just on a personal note, I have 32 members of community as far away from Iowa coming on Saturday, and we will all be using the community center to have our, to have our meal. Um, we also have an ice cream social that's held in the community center, and something that's really fun um, is the bingo night. And you might chuckle about that, but the kids just love to come to bingo night because um, everybody in the community donates a lot of things. They're just free and they play bingo and the kids can all go up and grab prizes and things like that. And this is all an effort to encourage the younger members of our community to become more involved so that we can keep these traditions going, which, which are very important to us. Other facilities that you may or may not heard heard about or uh, we're typically a place where in the morning it's not uncommon to see bike riders and joggers coming through uh, our area because it's, it's pretty darn safe to come through there. We have a baseball diamond that is used for um, obviously baseball games that's not uncommon in the weekend. You will just see a group of young adults show up that you have no idea who they are and a, and a baseball game breaks out there. We have a horseshoe pit, um, an old school horseshoe pit um, that's over there for people to play horseshoes. We have a basketball court that's relatively small, but it works. We have a volleyball net that's permanently set up. Again, you'll see younger adults, you know, showing up to play some volleyball. We have a tennis court that um, is, is on our grounds that's used. We also have a very, very popular children's playground. Have any of you walked through Camp Claycorn and seen our children's playground? I, I would encourage you to do that. And uh, it's an area where you'll see many families with young grandchildren and so forth out there playing. And of course the swimming dock, as Mark alluded to, which is extremely uh, popular for the area. It's a great way to get down there and, and a bunch of family will be there. Um, all of these are used as a frequent basis uh, by our community. Other scheduled activities that occur, a movie night is held in the baseball diamond, which is actually Saturday this weekend, and uh, uh, a sheet or screen is put up on the backdrop of the baseball diamond, and volunteers come in, and there's popcorn for everybody, and, and they show a movie. Um, and uh, if you're lucky, you have enough uh, stuff on for mosquitoes because you can get eaten alive out there during that. There's also a bake sale put on by um, 
with, they don't call them the church ladies anymore. I think you guys are now the church auxiliary. Am I correct on? No, we're the women's auxiliary. The women's auxiliary. They're, they're being modernized. <laughs> so there's a bake sale. And then another thing that's really important is, as you can imagine, with a community this size, is there's a annual work and cleanup weekend. And um, it takes a lot of participation. Remember, we're all volunteers. Everybody is, is doing this out of free will. And so there's quite a large grounds that needs to be cleaned up and maintained. And there's a big cleanup that occurs then. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention is, um, and maybe Mark's going to allude to this, uh, he said that I've been around a while. Many and almost all of our cottages have many generations of history behind them. So these cottages began, in some cases, people actually, I was around as a kid when there was tent camping, and then if you were big time, somebody you knew bought a trailer and brought that in, and then if you really got to big time, which in our family happened in 71, you were able to purchase one of the cottages. So the whole history that you're seeing, as you mentioned with Tom, I mean, it goes back to his parents, right? Being in Camp Claghorn. So I think it's really exciting and our sense of community is just really important for us. And that's about what I have. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. And there's the ball diamond backstop that supports the movie night screen. Okay, so the questions that I usually get the most are how does this really work? And how did it get to be what it is today? Um, and Eric alluded to this a little bit, you know, that there, there was tense, tense, tense when this first got started. But as time went by, um, people wanted things a little better than just tents, and uh, eventually some cottages started getting built. Uh, people became more regular in their attendance every year to the point where they were out there all the time. And uh, ultimately, all of those lots got divvied up in a way to satisfy, I, I don't really know how they did it, to tell you the truth. This would have been sometime, I suppose, in the... 20s or 30s, but uh, got divvied up to satisfy as many people as possible, especially all those that had uh, gotten permission to build buildings out there. And um, ultimately, we ended up with uh, a, a, an entity that uh, legally was legally constituted and that ran the whole camp. Now. For many, many years, Camp Cleghorn ran both the chapel and the operational camp. And that's because in 1897, nobody cared about taxes because there weren't any. No income taxes. Income taxes were first tried and, well, there were income taxes in the Civil War. Um, but those didn't last. And then uh, an income tax was instituted in 1916, and that was ruled unconstitutional. And finally, the Constitution was admitted, uh, amended to permit income taxes. And so that got us off on the road then of charities and deductions and all of that kind of thing. And so finally, a number of years ago, we looked at the situation and we thought, well, we can't, we can't be running a church and the operational uh, business as well altogether because they don't fit. It's, it's water and oil now. It wasn't back then, but it, it was now. So we split the chapel off from the operating corporation, and the chapel is now a 501c3 organization. It is the, the Camp Cleghorn Chapel Corporation. That's its official name. And it leases the chapel building and the fellowship hall from the operational organization. The operational organization is still the same. It's the Good Templars Training School, comma, Inc. period, doing business as Camp Cleghorn, because that's what everybody knows it as. And that's the organization now that is responsible for taxation issues. So, uh, as you might uh, imagine, uh, 
the corporation pays state and federal income taxes. And it's, it's just a corporation like any other corporation. It's got to report its income. It's got to uh, got the opportunity to take deductions for uh, improvements, whether they're amortized or short term, however, uh, but it, it does pay income taxes. And so that operating corporation uh, is responsible for running all of the lands of Camp Cleghorn, uh, with the exception of the chapel and the fellowship hall, which are under the purview of uh, the chapel corporation. The cottage owners all pay assessments, um, kind of like condominium dues. And those assessments go into uh, the general fund and they are spent for the maintenance of camp, for the payment of real estate taxes and the like. Um, at the very bottom, the real estate tax business, um, on the chain of lakes, uh, an assessment for a lot is based upon how much frontage, water frontage, it has. And the first so many feet are taxed at the highest rate, the second so many feet are taxed at a lesser rate, and then after that it's taxed at a subsequently lesser rate. Now because Camp Cleghorn is all one piece of property, there is a tax savings because of that. Because most of the water frontage <coughs> is taxed to the camp at the lower rate, not at the highest rate. Whereas most people on the chain probably pay uh, at the highest rate for, I think it's the first 50 feet, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So that's one of the advantages that the camp has is just the way the assessors do their taxation. But that still results in the next slide, which is our tax bill. You wouldn't want to have it, okay? Um, it's a $35,000 tax bill, and that is just on the land, none of the buildings. The chapel, the chapel itself is not assessed because it is used for religious purposes. But all of the other cottages are assessed as personal property. And that generates a tax bill per cottage of anywhere from 1000 to about 18 maybe even $2,000, depending upon what, what the cottage is like. So this particular tax bill, it's hard to read, but this line here is it's a $35,000 uh, real estate tax bill for the land. So you have to add the land taxes and all of the building taxes together to get a true picture of the taxation, and if you multiply 41 cottages by all of that, you'll, you'll get an idea as to how much is, is actually being paid in taxes. Okay, so how does Camp Cleghorn actually administer itself? I mentioned condominium dues. It's kinda like a condominium, but it's not exactly a condominium. I don't really know of any other place that works quite like this, I'm sure there is one or two somewhere, but, but not that I know of. And what has happened over the years is that when these cottages were finally built and ascribed their various lots, each of the cottage owners were issued shares in the entire ownership of the chapel, or the, not the chapel, the uh, operating corporation, which was also the chapel corporation at that time. And the number of shares issued was based upon some formula that I don't know what it is and anybody that I ask doesn't know what it was. And it probably happened sometime in the 1930s or 40s, but no one has the same number of shares. Well, some people have the same number of shares as others, but not everybody has the same number of shares as everybody else. But those shares entitle you to vote on camp business at the annual meeting of the operating corporation. So that's one thing that the individuals in camp have, is those shares in the corporation. The individuals also have a 99-year lease for where their cottage sits. And that lease right now expires in about 2051 or 54, or something like that. I don't expect it to be a problem for me. but. <laughs> It's really not going to be a problem for anybody else either because what's going to happen 
is that all of the owners of the shares that control the operating corporation will probably decide that they'd like to renew their leases. And the leases are not a way that the camp makes money. That's why it has assessments. The leases are just $1 to, to kind of give us a bookmarking as to where people have their ownership. So those leases are important because that's what gives you the right to have your cottage on that spot. And of course, the other thing that you get if you were to buy a place in Camp Claycorn is the person selling it to you would give you not a deed for your house, but a bill of sale because the cottage is personal property. That's how it's taxed. So there's three things that make up ownership in Camp Claycorn. Ownership of the corporation by shares, a 99 year lease, and a bill of sale for your cottage. And that's how the cottages, the, the, the existence in Camp Cleghorn is transferred from a, a willing seller to a willing buyer. I say at the bottom that the corporation functions a lot like a condominium. That's because there's this common land. Uh, the only thing that's interesting here is all the land technically is common land. It's just some of it is then leased out. But the, within 75 feet of the water's edge, pretty much, not always, but pretty much, that's all common land. No one owns waterfront in Camp Cleghorn. The camp owns all of that. Okay, next slide. The way governance of Cl Camp Cleghorn works is it's very old time. This is the way it was set up in the bylaws long, long ago. There were 15 directors that were going to act on behalf of camp, and the directors were going to elect officers, and they still do to this day. The directors meet three times a year, spring, summer, and fall, basically. The shareholders meet one time a year in the summertime, and the shareholders generally speaking only job is to elect the directors the directors are elected to three-year terms the terms are staggered so you always have five new people coming on or five re-elected people there's no restrictions on being re-elected and the directors basically conduct all of the business of camp it's uh it's somewhat cumbersome on occasion but it also develops a sense of cooperation and a sense, of, a sense of ownership in all of those people working together. So that's how we exist, and uh, we expect we will continue to exist that, that way indefinitely. Um, there's really uh, no simple way that this would ever change, because you've got 41 different sets of ideas <laughs> on how to run the place. OK, next slide. Oh, I'm going to stop. Questions about that? If you own a cottage or home in Camp Claghorn, that first 75 feet, can you do whatever you want to it or you can't do anything to it? The question is, what can you do with the first 75 feet? Which I think you mean between the water's edge and where your lease would actually be. Yes, and the answer is you around. can't do anything with it. And most of it is natural in camp. If you, if you go there and, and get on the other side of the cottages and look, or drive by in your boat yeah. and look in, it, it's, it's pretty much natural. Um, there are some things that do get done. There are stairways to, to provide access to the, the piers. Uh, but that's always with permission of the directors, not because you get to do it as a cottage owner. Okay, so the cottage owner can't do that without the permission of the directors? Correct. Okay. Correct. And then when, when you talked about community, is the community the, the cottage owners? Yes. That's how you define your community. Yes. And the trailer, and the trailer people too. Which we will get to. Can you swim other places other than the designated swimming places? And like in front of your cottage land area? Now, can you swim? Theoretically, you could, but there really isn't any great place to do that on Camp Claghorn. Either it's undeveloped and rocky, or it's got piers. Or muck. Or muck. <laughs> yes, I was just going to say that. Yeah. I, I do that. I take my dog down there. So uh, there, there's really no finer place to swim than down at the swimming dock. Do you have your own water wells for each? Question is, do we have water wells? And the answer is this. Years and years ago, there was a common water system. 
and one well, and, and there was piping and it was very shallow, and over the years it got dilapidated. It still services the fellowship hall, and I don't know if anybody else is on it anymore or not. I don't think so. I don't think so. We finally got everybody off. So everybody else has wells. Some are shallow, some are deep, depending upon where you are. And that would be put on your leased parcel. That's sewer is just like everybody else. We pay the same rates everybody else does, and they're put in the same way. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, um, when, if you own a cottage in Camp Claiborne, and you want to turn it into a year-round home, because most of them, I think, are year-round homes now, or they're winterized, um, who, do you have to go before the zoning board to be able to get permission to do that, or do you go to the director? Uh, you do all of the above. <laughs> we, and I think there's a slide on this later, but I don't know. Let's not, we won't look for it right now. We are subject to county zoning just like everybody else. But there is a special, uh, I'm not going to say Camp Cleghorn zoning code. It's, it applies to a couple of other spots too, but it's, it's this high density use because since Camp Cleghorn had developed so long ago and everything was closer together in some spots but very far apart in most of the places we, we didn't have a problem with too many cottages per the lot land that we had but we had some issues with them being too close together so they created a different zoning uh, scheme for Camp Cleghorn and others but we have to apply to or comply with those zoning laws and we also have our own rules as well about how you can do things in camp, how high the building could be um, and wide and how you can put a garage on it or not. Um, I, I don't know how many of the cottages are really uh, full-time year-round occupied, but 14, 14 or so out of the 41, but it's getting to be more and more. And so every once in a while, someone decides they're going to actually retire now and they're going to move to Camp Cleghorn full time and they want to upgrade their cottage to one that is a full time year round. And, and they can do that as long as they meet all the zoning requirements that apply to Camp Cleghorn and our own internal requirements. Okay, so like the zoning laws that apply to other places on the chain, the cottages on Camp Cleghorn don't have those same setbacks and that's that is thing. correct. Because there, of all the land that they have. Acres. That's right. There's kind of an averaging thing that's going on there. We do have a setback requirement. We, we have set, yeah, we have the same setback requirements from the lake as everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. When I bought my cottage, you couldn't go through with the deal unless you had a letter from your pastor attesting that you were a fine, upstanding <laughs> character. I told my pastor, here's the letter I need you to write. It's all done. You just have to sign it. And if you do, I'll let you come out to the camp once in a while. That has changed, as you might suspect, because the laws and the court decisions have changed as well. We cannot dictate to our owners to whom they sell. Um, we can only encourage. We do our best to educate the buyers before they are able to close that we have a community, that we have meetings, that we, we, we need participation. And it generally works, but condo associations have bad apples in them too. It does happen. So we're not perfect. Let's see if we got anybody else here. Uh, also, it's required building inspections. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Yes, they're they're done by again both tiers. Mm -hmm. This is slightly different. This back in the 1990s when we were starting a trolley line from the Pack and Trolley Company, um, I was collecting different pictures of the trolley line and old pack of pictures around, and a lady from Madison came to me and she had a place at Camp Claiborne. She said there was an original family that started Camp Claiborne. I'm trying to remember name was Woods or something. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Woods. Anyway, she had a bunch of pictures and she made copies for me for all the pictures mm -hmm. and I made copies for the store facility. And you know, they're like, like one of the original tents and the first cottage. There's some of those pictures and back there. I figured, yeah, I, was, I was expecting to see them all on the screen here, but I haven't seen any of them. <laughs> there was a picture of Governor of the the yeah. Idlehour boat at the at the um, electric dock where they, yeah. where they picked up. Right. All those pictures, you, you must have copies of those. Huh? We have lots of those pictures. It's just that. But not all of them. Yeah, not all of them. And, and it's funny because when I talk to people outside of camp, they usually aren't so interested in the history, although they are a little interested in that, but they really want to know, what are you guys doing in there, and how does it run, and how come you don't pay any income taxes, and that kind of thing, you know, and, and, and so we, we have to talk about all of that as well. So it's kind of a blend whenever we go out and, and talk, but all of the picture stuff, there's a lot of it back there that you can thumb through. It's, it's a very unique history. I'll get to you. Has an extremely yeah. unique uh, I know there are a few, Cottages, I believe it'd be basically south of the chapel on the opposite side from the, the lake. Are there, would there ever, ever be more lots made available for more cottages over away from the lake? Or no, no, we can't. We're maxed out by the zoning. Okay? Um, and the reason that that happened was because in the day, up here, there were double lots and people had uh, cottages back to back. So one would be closer to the water, one would be closer to the road. I'll let you use your imagination as to which one you would prefer, okay? <laughs> but as time went by, uh, for those that were closer to the road, in order to give people lots that were usable in current dimensional thinking, um, we created and were able to create a number of lots across the road and we encourage those that were in the back lots on the one side of the road to accept our offer of a bigger lot on the opposite side of the road. So they still didn't have water, but they had a bigger lot. And that's how those buildings, by and large, came to be. There's not very many of those, but there's a couple of them. Yeah. Yes. I'm just curious, do you pay taxes to what back the technology? Yes. Yeah. We don't pay any, well, the DNR doesn't tax anybody at, at all. So, yeah, we, don't, we pay taxes to Uncle Sam, to the state of Wisconsin in income taxes, and to the Wapaka County in property taxes. Yes. So the income for the camp is, would that just be the assessments that on the cottages? That's part of it. We also have rental income, which we're going to talk about in just a second, so you see how that works. Yes. Travel trailer. Your travel lot. Is that ever going to expand? Uh, no, that's maxed out too. That's what it's what it is. I may have misunderstood you, but did you say that the back cottage that moved across the street, or the front cottage that moved across? Yeah. The street? Let's not talk back and front. Let's talk water and road. Okay. The road is the one that moved across to the other side of the road. Okay. All right. That's understood. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on here. We may get to a few other things. All right, so as you go through camp, you'll finally come down to Camp and Court Road. Court is the road that goes through the mobile home park. Years and years ago, the ball diamond was not the ball diamond. It was full of trailers around the outside. And uh, some very far-sighted individuals got the idea that it would be nice to relocate all of those folks who had, they, they didn't have the cottage experience, but they had the, the, the next best thing, you know, in their minds, which was the trailers. And so we decided to create a mobile home park, which accommodated 20 trailers. Now, I guess I was a little inaccurate in telling you that we couldn't expand, but I, I really think we probably can't. 
It was laid out for 20. There are 18. The last two are closest to Long Cove Road. And I think the way the zoning laws have changed and morphed and changed again, that those two lots, we would meet a lot of resistance from the county if we tried to develop them. We don't want to develop them anyway because it, it would just create, well, no one wants to do it, so we're not going to do it. So, Mark, yes? What preempted that was in 1975, the sewers went in. Correct. And the state came to Camp Claghorn and said, the state came to Camp Claycorn in 1975, said we're putting in sewers around the whole chain, and would you like to move your trailers into the back so the sewers and wells and everything would be a little more appropriately done? And we jumped on it. So that was the impetus then. So here we are, if we leave Camp and Court Road, and this is right where that ball diamond backstop is, you can just see it right there, and we head toward the trailer park, Here's the ball diamond on the right, and there's the road on the left. We follow the road. We come into the trailer park. You can start, start to see them popping up. We turn. Here's a 90 degree turn. And now we're going in this direction here for a little ways. And we get to the next slide, and we're going to turn again. And there's Long Cove Road. Now, those 18 trailers pay rent to Camp Cleghorn. They're responsible for purchasing their trailer. And again, the sale and purchase of that is between individuals. Camp has nothing to do with that. Uh, but they also have to worry about getting a lease. They get a lease and they get a title for the mobile home. The one thing they don't get is they don't get ownership in the camp itself. They're, they're not entitled to vote at the meetings. We solicit their opinion. Some of our hardest workers and our biggest boosters come from the mobile home park. And, and they are very much part of our community. Uh, so we're, we're very glad to have them. But their payment uh, added together with the assessments is what generates our tax bill minus our expenses and gives us the money with which to pay our taxes and our, our upkeep. OK, next slide. Zoning. I knew there was one in here. So there is a special overlay district. Uh, we're not going to be able to do any further development because of various deed restrictions and zoning restrictions. <coughs> we have to keep track of our impervious surface. Impervious. impervious surface is what water can't go through, all right? Oh. Crushed granite is impervious surface, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, and the reason is because only so much percentage of our entire 29 acres can be impervious surface. We're not anywhere close to what, what we're permitted, um, but but they make us survey and keep track of that. So there's a lot of surveying that goes on at Camp Claghorn to try and keep everything in order. The DNR has mooring limitations. This isn't how many piers you can have, this is how many boats in the water you can have at any time, all right? And the number that's ascribed to us is 62 for the entire frontage. So that, that's what we have to keep track of. And we, we have a lot of interest in moorings and we have a whole subcommittee that watches over how the moorings are assigned and who gets first pick and all of that stuff so that people don't take their ball and go home unhappy. Do they include Ross Lake in their calculations of frontage? Right? No. No. They don't. They don't. Okay, next slide. Here's our old picture again. Okay. So you, you and the, of course the mobile home park is down in here. Okay, next slide. What is this? We finally found it at the end of the presentation. That's Lost Lake in wintertime. Are there fish in Lost Lake, Tom? Yes. Now, Now, was, was it you that was telling me that some winters you'd go back in there and ice skate on there? Oh, yes. It was great fun. Yeah, no, that would be pretty isolated, quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's, that's part of our uh, contribution to uh, the whole area is, is maintaining all of this property in its original state. And here, if you're up by our road and you're looking down in there, that's kind of what you see. And I don't know how much you got to go through with that to get to Lost Lake from where this picture is, but it's, it's a long way. Okay, next. I had this one put in here because 
You recognize those? Bad houses. They're, they're bad houses. And there's also a much bigger one around the corner. And we put those up because the bats, they like this building. And we thought we would try to encourage them to stick around because they eat bugs, and that's nice. But we would t thought we'd like them on the outside if they'd be willing to stay on the outside of the building. So we put these things up and, and they work. Um, it's kind of like the question about do we get bad apples once in a while, we still get bad bats that don't want to go in those houses. They want their own house somewhere else. But, but anyway, we, we do our best. So next. Um, Camp Cleghorn owns Camp Road and owns Court Road. These are not public roads. They are not owned by the county. Um, it's easy to sometimes think that they are because the bus comes through and the snowplow comes through, but that usually has to do with us accommodating them because it's shorter or they don't have to turn around or whatever. Uh, and so we do that because we try to be good neighbors. There is a speed bump. Maybe some of you have found the speed bump. I, I discovered this speed bump idea when my wife Karen and I were in Mexico on Isla Mujeres and uh, there were these ropes laying on the road. And I thought, what in the world are these ropes doing here? But they were little speed bumps that they put there and of course they don't get winter or anything so they just left them there all the time. But it's difficult to put a speed bump down and not ruin your road if you keep pounding stuff into it. So we thought we'd try this. So we got a two inch marine rope and tied it there and it, it works amazingly well. Uh, so that's our speed bump, but uh, we close the road during chapel services at the chapel, not, not the whole road, but at the chapel we do, and um, we try to protect the road. We're, I mean, we put in the road, we're responsible for maintaining the road. So a lot of people don't realize that, and we have some neighbors that, um, not in our camp, but that use this as a shortcut, which is okay as long as they uh, uh, go go slowly, you know. Uh, that's right. And and this was this was one of the th things that was that made the m removal of the boat livery from where it was to where Bruce Becker has it today a real boon to the camp because it got all of that traffic out of there. So that was nice. Okay, next. The end. <laughs> we would be glad to entertain any other questions uh, if you've got them. Well, in the back row. Okay. You said you got 41 cottages. Right. right. Those are the people that are part of the camp. The people that rent the trailers, the 18 trailers, are they part of the camp or are they just renters? They're just renters. They're not, they're not involved in the administration of the camp because they don't have any voting rights. But, but they are but, part of our community yes. and we have a meeting um, with them every year and solicit their input and things that they think we need to do better. Well, I, I didn't know that 41 included them or yeah, 41 no. separate plus the right. 60 people. 60, 60, units. 60 units. That is correct. Yep. Uh, excluding the lots on the lake and those house lots, were there significantly more trailers there in the 60s and prior to 75? The reason I asked, my parents had a trailer that one time. Yes. I yes. believe that's about the time they moved from Camp Corridor in 1975. I, I don't know how many were there, but they, they were in a ring all the way around. I, I grew up coming up here starting in 1959 camping and then we had a trailer for years and years, for 20 years, and I too. They were on the side where the, our little park is and on the other side yeah. along, oh, along right. both sides of the road and in like sardines. So yeah. it was, it there was a really mm -hmm. nice change to move them into the back. I, I, I probably, someone here will know, but I visited uh, uh, ocean Shore community in New Jersey, Jazzy, and it, it was uh, a Tempa camp, still is. Uh -huh. I, my daughter thought retired Methodist 
ministers lived in that mm. restricted community now. But what was fascinating is they were the tent, all the tents, and behind the tent, the cottages. Mm -hmm. and I, so they had like mm -hmm. almost like a tent. Mm -hmm. But it was, you would enjoy seeing what the results of that. Sure, sure. Our, our distant cousins. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. When Becca Marines moved, why did he sell? Why didn't he just sell it to somebody else and keep the Marines start going delivery people? Did Prell sell? Prell sold it to Becca. Oh, Tom sold it to Bruce Becker. Bruce still owns it. Oh, Bruce still owns it. Yes. No, the Prell sold it to Bruce Becker. Bruce still owns it. Yes. No, the air is gone. Well, the partner can't play more? Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, that we closed 19, year was that? Becker owned it then, and then he moved out. But, yeah. and so you're asking why he moved out? We kind of encouraged him to move out. That's right. Yeah. 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 There, his lease was up at that point. Right. Yes, and I think that there was also some concerns, environmental concerns, about having him right where he was. Um, after the livery closed down, we monitored the soils for a long time to make sure that everything was in order. There's also the shallow water. Yeah. What did you yeah. say about 83 or 82? I've got the sheet I'm looking at. It. Oh. Bruce bought it in 1978. In spring of 1990, Becker constructed the current facility. Because I bought one of their which I still have. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? What year was the chapel born? Huh, born. <laughs> chapel Bill. was built in? Uh, we, that's a conflicting thing, but uh, 1929, we think. Wow. And my house was built in 1928. So. Where do they park when they go to the chapel? All over the, all over the road. Yeah, it, it, there, there's, the parking is not ideal, but actually, you know, people come and they just park on the side of the road and then they walk a little bit. It's, it's not that far, uh, and it works. Okay, so the camp's not private now. So does that mean the people from Alpaca would go out there and go swimming? No. The camp is private as to everything but the chapel. The chapel. Everything but the chapel. Yeah. The chapel is public. And the fellowship. And the fellowship hall. Well, yeah. it it's really the chapel. Yeah. The fellowship hall is available to members. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose there could be other times that it might be, but, but it's, it's generally the chapel that we look at as being open to the public. Mm -hmm. We have people come by foot, by boat, by bicycle. So it's not just a lot of people just come in any way they can. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a question up here as to whether we have a lifeguard. The answer is swim at your own risk. No lifeguard. Well, actually, we did until about two weeks ago, then it disappeared, so we're working on another we one. Have we one. We have a new one, okay. It's there and the ring is there. As of yesterday. We don't know. So if you've got it, bring it back. The safety The question is number one, do the mobile homes come up for sale? And the answer is yes, they do. I would say there's probably one a year, or one every other year, maybe. Not quite, but it, it's not uncommon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But in terms of the community, and I can speak to that because my parents bought the place we're in in 71. You'll never, it would be very rare to see a for sale sign on anything. It's rare because normally there is somebody else that knows of it or there's kind of, it gets passed down to family members. So it's very unlikely that you would see a for sale sign. And there, there's people that are inquiring and they find out about somebody that might be interested, but most time, like in my case, it's, it's family members that it goes uh, through that process. And the rent is payable annually one time. Right. How it works. 
I'm not, I'm not letting you ask questions. <laughs> there's another, there's a member back here in the back row of Joel. If you own a trailer, can you rent it out by the week? No. No. The question is, if you own a trailer, can you rent it out by the week? No. No. If you own a cottage or a house, can you rent it out by the month? Or the week? Then the question is, if you own a cottage, can you rent it out by the week? And the answer is yes. There are, there are a whole bunch of rules you have to comply with if you do that as well. That, that, that's, that's not something that camp encourages because it diminishes the community and fellowship to have people that just come and go that don't participate in everything. But it, we don't preclude people from doing it because a lot of people do uh, do it once in a while and some do a very decent job of it and so we allow it. Okay. One more. Are banks providing mortgages on the property if you want to buy one? Well, now I'm going to ask you a question. How much money do I have? No. <laughs> if you want to mortgage something, what does it have to be? It usually has to be first our land. Land. What do you own in Camp Cleghorn? Any land? No. Not a stitch. So you really can't get tr traditional bank financing. It is also a rule in Camp Cleghorn that the camp will not recognize any collateralization that the the cottage owner might do to their ownership interest in, in the place because we want to reserve the full right to repossess and cancel the lease if there is a problem. So banks have a big problem with that. You know, so generally speaking, if you're going to get financing, you're going to have to put up something else to, to cover what you buy in Camp Cleghorn, which does make it a little more difficult for some people, but that's the rule. Now, as you look around the chain, there are a lot of the old cottages that are being torn down and new ones put up. Is that happening very much in Clayton? Yes, I would say. Um, you know, we had a spate of a, a couple of them that got torn down and, and new ones put up. Um, now things have kind of settled down, but I'll bet you there's, there's the potential for that to happen for another 10, I would imagine. Uh, but I haven't heard any rumblings yet. It's nice when you can go through a summer or two without anybody having just built something. By the way, you may not build in Camp Cleghorn between Memorial Day and Labor Day. No construction is allowed. Okay? And you may know that, that public service is coming through to put in underground lines throughout the community. And they wanted an easement from us to do that, and we said, we're happy to give you an easement. But you're not doing it between Memorial Day and Labor Day, or we're not signing it. And they said, oh, well, okay, we can work around that. So they, they agreed, and we signed, and it wasn't but a week or two ago that I got a call from the subcontractor saying, oh, can't we please come in? It, it would be so much easier if we could come in. Uh, and we, we have a great track record, and we're very safe, and yada, yada. And I said, read my lips. <laughs> no. So. So what were the five trucks right, ar right around the entrance to Camp Claiborne tonight? Oh, they hit a, oh. they hit a gas line. They hit a gas line. Um, yeah, doing, they were drilling. They're doing Claiborne Road. They're not doing Camp Claiborne right. yet. Yeah. They're not going to do us till after Labor Day. But there were these five cars. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. yep. no, right they were right. drilling oh, for a new yeah. pole, and they hit a gas line. <laughs> Apparently, they didn't call Digger's Hotline. Yeah, yeah. So that's what triggered all of that. <laughs> I, I can't answer that because that's, the, yeah, but I, I, I know that public service is trying to bury everything that it can, especially in high density areas like, like around the chain, because when the storms come through, especially the ice storms, um, this, this has just been a huge problem for them. And if they can get those, uh, you know, the, the one that carries all of the power is the one way at the top. This is disappointing. This is disappointing to us in camp when we realized what was going to happen. The one way at the top is 7,800 volts, and that's what gets stepped down by the transformer, and then gets parceled out to the houses. So what are they burying? 
that one. Because that's the one they can't stand to lose because that shuts everything off. Are they burying the ones that go into the cottages, for example? Well, they will if you want to pay for it, but, but not because they're going to be generous about it. And will the poles come out so that it look really great? No, because the telephone company and the cable company aren't doing a thing. So all that's going to happen is one little wire is going to disappear. Although in Camp Cleghorn it's kind of nice because in that ball diamond there was one little wire that ran away from one end way over to the other end to feed the trailer cord. And that finally got reconfigured and done. And so now when they do this, they'll finally take that down. Do you allow solar power panels? Pardon me? Do you allow solar um, yet the panels? Oh, uh, there's no reason that we would preclude it. That's, there's no rule or ordinance again. It's, it, no. Too many trees. I, I, might, yeah. I might speak to that in that I know a resident recently was wanting to get off of our bigger spectrum, right? To go to directly here or something. And it's very restricted because of the amount of trees to get to the satellite. So, um, you know, it, pro it may or may not work just because. Remember, we're, we are preserving this whole area. Uh, nobody can just go out and cut a tree down in Camp Claiborne. That's not allowed. So, I mean, it's going to continue to sprout up, and, and, the, and the access is, is, is less in Camp Claiborne. One more here. So, a bit of information. We're getting the electric up underground, but they're also going to do gas. They're going to redo the gas mains and the laterals within the next year or so. Interesting. Really? Well, Especially if they keep hitting them, huh? hope, Hopefully they'll have a better crew than they had today. Was there another question here? I just wondered about the footprint of a cottage. You can't go beyond the footprint, the original right. footprint. I mean, you could remodel and all that, but you, you, know, you can't go up. Oh, you mean if someone took down the cottage, could they put up a bigger building? Yeah. Possibly. Oh, okay. That's possible. As it long as it restrictions on either side. Right, right. right. Back yeah, but if you had just a teeny little cottage, you could certainly oh. expand it the other way. Yeah. yeah. All approved by zoning and so on and so forth. So it really depends because we're regulated very strong on all of that. So Back row. It sounded like from the answer to my last question that if a, if a person got in trouble, they could actually lose their shares? That is possible. And then what happens? <laughs> Well, then we probably end up in court, <laughs> okay? Because it's all or nothing if you get to that point. But ultimately, I mean, th these are remedies that are reserved to the camp if somebody is violating the rules uh, and they're given notices and they don't comply, their lease can be revoked uh, and their shares can be recovered, so. Just take them to the chapel. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.